We're going to get started here. So this is building massive scale generative AI services with Kubernetes and open source. My name is John McBride. Um, I was the head of infrastructure and the lead AI developer at Open Source, which was a small company recently acquired by the Linux Foundation. Um, and I'm going to do a quick poll. Um, who has built RAG applications before or any kind of RAG thing? OK. Um, who's built like a big Kubernetes, like tons of GPUs, a big platform for your developers? OK, a couple of people. Great. Um, it's funny coming to this talk, because, or I guess coming to this KubeCon, because in Chicago last year, this is the talk I wish I had. Uh, I built a bunch of this stuff and designed a bunch of this stuff and our, our RAG applications inside of open source. Um, and it was really like bad. <laughs> like this is not going to be the kind of stuff that you would want to inevitably ship to your enterprises. This was like startup mode. We're shipping AI. We're trying to find market fit. Uh, we're going to do what we can to save money um, and hit some kind of scale that will be impressive to the market, um, our potential investors, so on and so forth. So um, the thing that we ended up building at Open Source is something called Star Search. And what it really is, is kind of, you know, we called it a co-pilot for your Git history, but really the idea was to derive unique insights and understandings off of Git, uh, GitHub pull requests and issues, and try to go a little deeper than something like GitHub Copilot. Um, this thing you could you know, get in the chat interface. We've all seen these kind of chat interfaces before. You could ask a unique question. So this question here in this example I asked, you know, who are the best developers that know Tailwind and are also interested in Rust? And then through pull requests, issues, a bunch of the metrics and data that we consumed, we could then give some interesting answers. Um, when I first built and stubbed this thing out, like many of us, I used a, a service, just an inference service like Anthropic or OpenAI, and our <laughs> initial bill was absolutely, absolutely astronomic. You can't really see it on the slide here, but um, this was just like four days, and it was already like four thousand plus dollars in spend. Um, I did some quick back of the napkin math, and looking at it, it was going to be you know something like let me see, I got to actually read these. Um, using GPT-4, it was going to be like $30 per 1 million tokens input and $60 per 1 million output tokens. And again, remember, this is all like last year when I designed all this and like we were trying to ship all this. So we did not have the benefit of, you know, a bunch of the great platform engineering things that people have been talking about uh, this KubeCon. Uh, we were going to target about 40,000 plus GitHub repositories, which was kind of like big enough scale that we could have, you know, the breadth but also the depth of the kind of insights we were targeting. Um, we were assuming this back of the napkin math that it was going to be about 190 words per day in issues and pull requests, which is going to be roughly about $600 per day. It was going to hit us at about $200,000 plus per year. And that was quite a lot <laughs> for our small eight-person team at this you know, startup. Um, so finding any way that we could actually reduce that spend was going to be huge. Um, and Talking to my colleagues and even in this talk, you know, practicing it and going through the slides, I feel a little crazy being like, we're going to engineer all this stuff on Kubernetes to save money and it's going to be great. Um, but ultimately what we did is we used RAG pipelines on top of Kubernetes. Um, again, what I would call maybe an arbitrary approach, but what really worked for us to hit that big scale, that 40,000 plus GitHub repositories, chugging through terabytes of data every day, um, giving us the kind of product feature that we were looking for. So. In a big, broad summary, the way this thing works is it consumes the GitHub events feed uh, via this thing that we would like to call the fire hose. And you can look at it today. It's at api.github.com slash events. And each time you hit that, it gives you a little bit of time series data <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, each time you go to that API endpoint. And you get you know, just kind of a consistent feed of events always happening on GitHub. Um, if anybody's familiar with the GitHub archive, that's what that's based on. So we consume that feed. Uh, we use Kubernetes to orchestrate um, the inference engine on top of a couple of GPUs. Um, and then we use Timescale uh, and PG Vector to give us the embeddings to actually do vector search. Um, and then OpenAI on the tail end of all that. So um, I want to dive deep into how this actually worked, uh, how we hacked a bunch of this together, what it looks like today, um, and some lessons and learnings from this whole product offering. So, Again, on the very front end is this thing that we would call the, the GitHub events fire hose. And really, it's just this like constant stream of events 
always coming in. And we built this little microservice called It's Pizza Time. Um, everything at Open Source was a pizza pun, so get ready for more and more pizza puns in this talk. Uh, but It's Pizza Time was essentially a nozzle around this fire hose that we could consume all of these GitHub events um, and all of this time series data to give us the kind of uh, constant flow of what's happening on GitHub all the time. Um, yes, it's a pun from the Spider-Man movie. <laughs> But uh, what this data ends up looking like when, we, when it actually lands in its pizza time um, is it has a timestamp, it has a specific type like pull request opened or issue opened or issue closed, pushes, uh, all different kinds of stuff, and then a bunch of metadata and a bunch of content inside of that metadata. Uh, its pizza time will process it just a little bit um, and then send it into timescale, <clears throat> which is a Postgres extension for time series database stuff. Um, and then ultimately, that's, that's what gives us open source as it was before all this AI stuff, was the histograms and the charts. And you know anybody who's familiar with like the Grafana product offerings and Prometheus and that whole time series database stuff, you know this, this is pretty par for the course as far as uh, time series things go. Uh, but we wanted to take it a little bit further. And we wanted to take that time series data and all that content from pull requests and issues and try to derive some interesting things off of uh, generative AI. So um, using all of that stuff, we built something called the Star Search Embedder. And going to a bunch of the talks this week, <laughs> this is basically Kubeflow <laughs> or Q, but like a tiny, bad Go microservice that I built. <laughs> Again, at the time, we didn't really have the benefit of these things being ubiquitous. So um, learn from my learnings and you know, take something off the shelf. Don't build your own thing. <laughs> but what Star Search Embedder basically does is it looks for some content inside of the time series database um, based on some filters, based on some criteria. It grabs that content, and then it uses our Kubernetes platform um, with a bunch of the GPUs and the inference service um, to do a few things. Primarily, uh, what we're concerned with at this step is actually creating a, a summary of that content. And why we wanted to do that was because the content was very, very messy. If you've ever looked at like the raw body of a pull request or an issue, it's got tags, it's got a bunch of like markdown cruft, it's got like all kinds of things that honestly will just, con will just co uh, confuse an LLM. It'll look at that and just be like, oh, like what is this person doing? There's a bunch of markdown, a bunch of random code and stuff. So we needed a specific service to actually summarize that content um, that we could then use in embeddings to get better vector search. And we'll look at that as we kind of go through this flow. Um, but before we go too deep into you know, the rest of the flow, oh yes, generate a summary for the content, that's all that stuff, um, I do wanna take a deep dive on the Kubernetes stuff specifically and this small inference platform that we built. So in the end, the way that you know, I kinda like to think about Kubernetes is you know, it's just a way to like, get some compute. Um, it's all networked together. You can build some services on top of it and ultimately you know, uh, bring some value to your customers or to your end engineers doing inference and all this stuff. So these uh, nodes on this Kubernetes cluster are a couple of T4 GPUs on Azure, and we used managed service off of AKS um, to essentially give us kind of that base layer of compute. Um, I just went to the last talk about <laughs> DRA, and like I just it blew my mind because I had to do a bunch of this by hand to actually get the GPUs, label them correctly, get the drivers on, all that stuff. Um, so the way that we actually put the drivers on these is installing the NVIDIA device plugin daemon set, uh, which you can use the node taints and the node selectors to actually make that happen. Um, and shout out to the AKS team for making that pretty easy to follow along with, but um, was a pretty high touch solution. Um, definitely check out DRA for some of the awesome stuff happening there with. Uh, acquiring devices for these things. So um, once we have the GPUs, and once we have kind of that whole node pool set up, um, then we can install something called VLLM. And VLLM is an awesome piece of software for essentially serving your, your LLM. Um, and at the time, was necessary for us because, uh, again, at the time, it was the only one that seemed to support concurrent clients, uh, concurrent clients well. Um, I think Olama does this now, and I think Llama.cpp does this now, but we were essentially like kind of backed into a corner where it's like, we want to like use open large language models, but like, how are we going to do this without, you know, spending a ton of money on open AI, Anthropic, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, VLLM is great. Um, the way I sort of think about it is like, you know, you got your LLM, 
it's a bucket, it's serving it out of the bucket. Um, and what makes VLLM also really interesting is it uses something called paged attention memory, which uh, allows it to effectively use the memory on your GPUs for concurrent clients. Um, my background is not in data science or like <laughs> in Python really at all, but uh, it works really well. Definitely recommend it, go check it out. Uh, what else did I put on here? So yeah, it serves an open large language model that you can get off of Hugging Face pretty easily using VLLM um, and then serve that concurrent um, OpenAI compatible API. Yes, that's a very important part of this as well. Um, VLLM uses an, OPA, uh, an OpenAI API that looks just like it. Like it, it acts just like it. Um, we could very easily lift and shift our clients to use VLLM instead of OpenAPI, OpenAI, excuse me. <laughs> Um, okay, moving on. So the open large language model going even deeper is another important part about this. Um, there's just a bunch of these out there. We know about the Mixtra ones, we know about the Llama ones, um, but there's even like really good community ones that are very small, like seven billion parameters that enable us to use them um, without having to you know, have these ginormous images that then you know, slow down node startup time, because we have the GPUs if we're bringing up like a bunch of spot GPUs or something. Uh, so some of the benefits I see of these small, open, large language models, come on, um, they're usually easily and freely accessible. Um, the kind of idea around what quote unquote open source large language models mean is still kind of, you know, maybe out for the count, but um, the OCI has recently had some good distinctions around what they would classify as open source large language models. But usually, you know, for the startup, you know, startup life, you can just go get them on Hugging Face and they're usually easily and freely available. Um, they often are more permissively licensed. I am not a lawyer, so please check with your legal department, but usually you can kind of modify them, you can requantize them, you can kind of tweak them, you can usually easily fine tune them. Um, but again, check with your legal department before putting those into production. Uh, they're very small. They're very small and very efficient for most use cases. And especially for something that revolves around uh, natural language processing, like in our case, generating a summary, um, this was huge. It was just so simple to plug and play with small models that could just give us a, a pretty good summary. Um, okay, so rolling all that back, back into the cluster, we have the daemon sets, we have VLLM. Uh, VLLM kind of does its thing and gets the model for us off hugging face. Um, and then at this point, we can actually enable a service, um, a good old fashioned Kubernetes service. Um, and for more advanced cases, this could be something that, you know, maybe is, you know, we just put a, a, a normal old Kubernetes service up there, but maybe you want to use some sort of internal service mesh or something. But for our cases, uh, Kubernetes service. This enabled us to use that OpenAI compatible API as if it was OpenAI internal to our cluster for those other services. What this looks like is, you know, again, good old fashioned Kubernetes DNS, VLLM service, dot VLLM namespace, SVC, dot cluster, dot local. And then uh, we can use that OpenAI compatible API at v1 slash chat slash completions. So how do we manage all this? Um, Good old fashioned DevOps and GitOps. Nothing special here. And I, th I think that you know, just worked for us really, really well. We use Pulumi uh, with infrastructure as code for managing and bootstrapping all those clusters. We have several different environments for testing validation, which mostly just end up being their own monolithic clusters. Um, we use GitHub Actions for automatic container builds and deployments and pushing those up to Azure's container registry. Um, and then Grafana alerting on call and basic validation with some of their semantic alerts. So nothing fancy. Like, again, this time last year, I think the sort of how do we do ML ops was still an open question. Um, so I think there's some great offerings from some companies now um, that make deeper validation of your services uh, much better. So definitely check them out. Um, a quick demo. So what I want to show here is actually, uh, you know, this is the part of the demo we all get to look at YAMLs and stuff, but I'm um, actually show kind of how this would work from inside of the cluster as well. Um, so first going into the NVIDIA device plugin daemon set. Um, is this font size okay? Bigger? Smaller? All right. Seems good. Um, so the NVIDIA device plugin daemon set, that gives us the actual ability to use those devices on cluster. Uh, we have the VLM namespace. We have uh, a VLLM secret, which specifically for VLLM gives us the hugging face token so that we can actually pull a model from uh, hugging face. And if people aren't familiar with hugging face, it's kind of the GitHub 
of, of models and you know, being able to see these things, inspect these things, modify these things. Um, the VL on daemon set is interesting where we have the specific node selector and then the actual tolerations for the SKU being GPU. Um, and this was kind of our just approach to making sure that every single, uh, every single node inside of the GPU node pool um, could have that. And I think there's, yeah, just gonna be so many better ways to do this in the future in Kubernetes besides having to essentially hand roll selection for those daemon sets on those nodes. Um, inside of the OLM, we just grab the VLLM uh, OpenAI pod from their upstream. Um, and then some arguments, and these are kind of interesting. We grab uh, this model from the bloke who was kind of a plurific guy uh, quantizing a bunch of models at the time. So this is just a Mistral 7 billion parameter model. Um, it uses a specific uh, quantization uh, called AWQ. And then we also define that it should use 95% of the GPU's memory. And this was some parameters we had to tweak around with and try to you know, kind of play with to ensure we were getting the most usage out of just the few GPUs we had. Because, you know, again, we're still trying to save money, <laughs> even with GPUs that we're using on Kubernetes. Um, but it also was low enough that we weren't seeing hardware fault tolerations. I think if we were, you know, a bigger engineering department, you know, not of one person, <laughs> we would have gone a little deeper into that, tried to find out, you know, like what are ways we could optimize, maybe start using spot GPUs more often um, in the cases we have load, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, on the cluster, I also have this simple pod. This is just an Ubuntu pod. Let me flip over to that real quick. And on this pod, you know, it's just good old fashioned Ubuntu. It's got curl. It's got dig. Um, let me go to my notes real quick and grab this real quick. So this dig is just looking at VLM service, .vlm namespace, SVC, et cetera, et cetera. And we can just validate real quick that we have an IP, good old fashioned Kubernetes service, nothing fancy there. Um, then down here, we can actually use that service. I'm gonna put this in here. And this is using that OpenAI compatible API for V1 models. If I go to that, that sends that back right away because this is running on that same node, um, so almost instantaneous. And we can see that that model, the Mistral 7 billion parameter one, is running um, or available, I guess, on this service. So the next thing that we would want to do is some inference to actually get some text generated. So I'm going to use curl here, put this in here. And what we get is we're using, uh, we're specifying the model with the Mistral 7 billion parameter one. We have a message with the role user and some content where we're asking who won the World Series in 2020. We send that away. This will take just a hot second. And it said, the Tampa Bay Rays won the World Series in 2020. I don't actually watch baseball, so great. Go Tampa Bay. <laughs> uh, but in essence, that is all on our cluster, um, on our GPUs, running through VLLM, running through that Mistral model um, to do some inference for you know, this demo pod. Now replace demo pod with anything else that might be running on your cluster at, to actually do inference. So rolling all the way back now, um, we can go back to the star search embedder, which you know, replace this with Q, replace this with one of your own microservices doing inference, uh, with uh, Kubeflow, any of that stuff. And now we can actually get those summaries from our GitHub content, which at this point are very, very well cleaned up. Um, and again, giving you kind of the idea of scale, some 40,000 GitHub repositories, the way we filtered for those were the top 40,000 repositories starred on GitHub. So things like Kubernetes, Kubernetes, um, things like Home Assistant, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a huge sort of win for us. Um, the cost factor here, instead of using OpenAI, was like a couple thousand a month or something. Uh, I think around 1,500 a month, depending on our spot GPU usage. So this was a huge win from just a cost optimization standpoint. <laughs> With an engineering department of one um, at a small company that was you know, trying to find uh, and bring some sort of AI inference product to market. Um, so continuing through the flow, we have that piece of content that's been generated, uh, that summary. Um, and we want to use a text embedding model at this point to get a vector for that content. And in this case, we were continuing to use OpenAI's uh, text embedding models, which was, was great. You know, still very cheap. Text embedding is not expensive. Um, and we didn't want to lift and shift too many things all at once because that would have just been unsustainable. What the text embedding model gives us is a vector, which is just a list of numbers. Um, really, the way I sort of like to think about it is kind of this model's quote-unquote 
understanding of that text content, content that you give it, uh, which then you can use you know, in vector space to find out the differentiation between other vectors in vector space. It's really just a way to do vector search, which is just a way in the end to do uh, uh, nearest neighbor search uh, with other content. So uh, we take that vector, we store it in a vector store, uh, PG vector in this case, because we were like all in on Postgres at this point. We didn't want to adopt too many technologies that were going to be too messy for our small engineering team. Um, and all of those vectors inside of PG vector, um, star search embedder is gone, thanks star search embedder. Uh, we take all that content and all those vectors and all those references to that content and inevitably, that's what gives us the capability to do a cosine similarity search, that nearest neighbor search, uh, which is really uh, yeah, a way for us to take content, figure out what kind of quote unquote meaning is from those text embedding models, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we used an index called HNSW, which is typically recommended for text type content, um, but you do trade off some accuracy. So you, using HNSW, in your cosine similarity vector search, you're not always gonna get the same result every single time. And for most chat rag type applications, that's okay. That's even kind of desired, where you don't always want the bot to be like saying the same thing every single time, but you do, you do trade off some, uh, uh, some accuracy. So we, we did do some additional steps with PG vector of kind of separating some of the tables and trying to shard those in interesting ways, but I won't get too into that. Um, that helped us a bit with performance, uh, but PG vector, e even in the last year, has had massive strides in performance and capability. So I'm a huge fan of PG vector. Um, I think it's an awesome community project. So that's kind of the whole like backend system. We've like embedded a bunch of stuff. Um, we have a bunch of like AI text summaries that can help us you know, keep things clean. Um, and now we can actually look at Star Search, uh, which is kind of the more product front end offering. And really Star Search is like three or four agents <laughs> all in a trench coat. Um, and when I say agents, you know, I think a lot of people love to throw around the word agents. It's really just this idea of function calling inside of your code. Um, and we'll look at how that specifically works. But most models today um, support function calling. OpenAI was one to really sort of pioneer this. Um, and inevitably, decisions we made last year, we did use OpenAI's function callings with uh, GPT-4. I think it was just GPT-4 at the time. Um, so let's get into that. Um, the way this works is this is kind of a multi-agent approach, again, OpenAI function calling, um, using our existing services architecture in our API, in our backend. So we have a bunch of the stuff sort of split up with specific uh, database calls and specific services that these, these AI agents can essentially use inside of our backend. So the very first AI agent that sort of receives a query from a user is one that we call the preprocessor agent. And the preprocessor agent has its toolkit. That's a bunch of the functions that it has inside of, the, uh, inside of the function calling stuff. And its main job is to detect prompt injection attacks, clean up users' prompts, um, and attempt to correct any like obvious spelling mistakes that somebody might make. Um, so if you misspell Kubernetes, it can usually catch that. Uh, at that point, once it's sort of done its job and cleaned up a bunch of stuff and looked at the prompt and make sure that there's something wonky going on, um, it will then hand it off to the manager agent. And this is kind of the central agent that decides which of the other agents to hand off questions to. Um, the manager agent will look at the query. It, uh, it has its toolkit of a bunch of other agents that it can call. Uh, the Bing search agent, the pull request agent, uh, the issues agent. Uh, we even have a release agent that we built that could tell you about new releases that are happening on GitHub and, and certain projects, um, so on and so forth. This was extremely extensible, and we would have continued to build more and more capabilities into these agents. Uh, but let's say in this example, it decided to use the pull request agent. Maybe somebody's asking about recent pull requests in Kubernetes Kubernetes. It would decide, you know, obviously based on asking about pull requests, to use this agent. So the manager agent is gonna call up the pull request agent. It's gonna hand off the prompt to that agent. Again, it keeps going. Uh, this agent has its toolkit of a bunch of stuff that it can do, uh, like performing vector search and summarization of those results from vector search, um, doing inference uh, from a bunch of these other parallel things in its toolkit. Um, but ultimately, again, this is using OpenAI function calling um, to ultimately do uh, to grab relevant content from our, our vector storage. Uh, so in this case, again, in this example, it's going to use vector search. Um, and I'll fly through this real quick because this kind of gets into more of like 
how does RAG work? And most people kind of understand that, that seems. So we're going to use the text embedding model. Uh, we're going to grab our vector, which again is just a list of numbers. And again, this is just the list of numbers, the quote unquote understanding uh, of that question. And that question then we can compare using a cosine similarity search, nearest neighbor, uh, to actually grab the most relevant content, the nearest neighbor specifically, and get that stuff. Um, this then gets into kind of the prompt engineering part of the talk. Uh, and really, the way I like to think about prompt engineering is really a preamble, the context, and then the question itself. Um, the preamble is just going to be your system message, which is something like, you are a helpful agent. You know about pull requests. You know this about GitHub. You know, more or less basic stuff. Um, that relevant content is then going to go inside of the context part of your prompt. Um, you sort of inject that in. And then the question really is just the user prompt, ultimately, uh, which you can then kind of give it uh, a preamble even inside of the system message to tell it like, hey, you're going to see a question about pull requests. Your job is to ABC XYZ. So um, that's sort of how I like to think about prompt engineering. But this space moves so fast. There's, there's so much happening so quickly. So I'm sure even that has changed. So at this point, um, we've sort of done the RAG. Um, OpenAI AI function calling loop grabs all of that. Um, it generates a sort of answer to all of that. It hands it all the way back up the stack to the manager agent. And then the manager agent looks at that and returns it to the user to ultimately give a context-aware answer. So that's you know, basically RAG 101 with our own Kubernetes platform on top of it. Um, all of that sat on top our API, uh, which sat on api.opensauce.pizza, which was all within sort of the Kubernetes stuff. Um, and you might see where I'm going with this kind of thinking to the future. Um, some practical lessons and tips here. Um, using LLMs to pre-bake those summaries was huge for us. Um, we saw massive problems with like ungroomed text, um, especially stuff that people could just like slap anything in. You would not believe the kind of crap <laughs> that people put on GitHub uh, that would confuse these LLMs to every degree. So just having a service that could be like, hey, clean this up, please, was huge. Um, using indexes like HNSW to trade off for some accuracy was big. Um, that's a big performance upgrade in our vector search. Um, again, huge, huge cost savings using small LLM inference. Um, just a small 7 billion parameter mo model was good enough for us. And I would argue um, is good enough for most natural language tasks. There's not a lot that I think <laughs> ginormous models are needed for, usually. Uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, challenges. Um, again, I think the like ML ops observability validation question still seems to be unanswered. It was definitely unanswered this time last year when you know, I was first conceptualizing and architecting a bunch of this. So um, I'd love to see more standards. I know that OpenTelemetry is definitely looking at this. So um, I think there's some exciting stuff to come in this space soon. Um, getting dedicated GPUs, even tiny T4s, was still hard. Uh, the, I mean, even today, like I, I went to like 50 talks at <laughs> this conference about how hard it is to get GPUs on the public cloud. Um, I don't have a solution for that. Um, using those open models on VLLM trained for function calling. So again, like I said, we used OpenAI's function calling loops. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to use one of the public models within our kind of uh, Kubernetes platform with our GPUs to really bring it all inside of our own platform. Um, the kind of two things that were left on top of OpenAI were sort of the final, the final inference result uh, and the, well, and text embedding uh, and the actual uh, function calling stuff. So um, huge opportunity for us to move it all in house and do even more cost savings if we wanted. Uh, ultimately, I think the product scope for this should have been a little narrower. <laughs> I'm going to put on my product person hat right now. And, you know, targeting 40,000 plus GitHub repositories was a fun challenge to bring to market. Uh, but I think in hindsight, I think we would have had more success. Um, and more validation in the market if we had targeted like the top 5,000 or something. Like, there's also a lot of crud on GitHub, um, a lot of crud that we consume. Um, you know, like everybody's CS 101 homework is on there. <laughs> uh, and that's just a lot of data that ends up coming in. Data we weren't capturing inside of Star Search, but ultimately, I think, yeah, there's a, there's a balance in there in hindsight. And, you know, with everything, hindsight is 2020. Um, again, I'm very, very excited about uh, DRA, which is this way for. Uh, pods and applications on your cluster to uh, request and allocate 
those hardware resources like GPUs and stuff. It's in alpha currently, but um, yeah, exciting stuff to come. Um, and that's it. The show notes for this are at github.com slash jpmcb slash kubecon na24. I'd love to take any questions that you have. Well, I'll hang around if anybody <laughs> is around. Oh, we got one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Yeah. Did you sort of happen, or was there anything you could do with that? Yeah. Uh, so the question for those who couldn't hear it was, how did we handle hallucinations, you know, through this whole chain? Um, it, it was, it was challenging. Um, I think, you know, I, we did evaluate some products that would allow us to kind of do, you know, some crazy like statistical analysis around like, oh, you tweaked your your system prompt here. We're gonna throw like a thousand prompts at this new system message and this new model that you maybe put into the whole pipeline and see like how, you know, how it fits with the whole product offering, I guess. Uh, we never, we didn't get very far with actually doing that. Again, startup life, so we just kind of <laughs> prayed for the best. Um, and I think because we, you know, the summarization part of that was huge. We, we had such a problem before that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, it's kind of an open question. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, as a part two or phase two, are you planning to move away from device plugin and embrace the GPU operator and other stuff? Or are you planning to, as phase two, to embrace GPU operator so that you don't have to do the device plugin and all those things uh, as phase two? Good question. Oh, I'm losing my voice now. Uh, yes, we, we would want to build out the platform so that it was less, <coughs> excuse me, me hand rolling, you know, a bunch of the node selectors and the GPU pools and all that. We would want, we would want to eventually be able to, you know, use, <coughs> excuse me, oh my gosh, uh, we'd want to be able to use, you know, what we could from the community spot GPUs scale up, scale down with need, because like in the middle of the night, nobody's using this mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> so any way we could like utilize an operator that would scale that down, we evaluated Car Carpenter at some point. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the big lesson that I think everybody should take away from this is that like it's possible with like a small, small company, you know, at reduced cost to build this kind of platform, um, be it as crufty and startupy as it was. Um, but I think there's so many better solutions uh, today versus, yeah, versus like what we built this time last year. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Kind of in a similar vein. You mentioned that you chose VLLM because at the time it had, it was like the only thing that had that feature that you wanted. Yeah. Um, would you still do so today? That's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, Probably. Um, I, I've really liked VLM. Um, I haven't been as involved in like evaluating the community recently. Um, I really like Olama as well, you know, mostly because I could run it on my Mac. <laughs> VLM doesn't work very well on, on you know, MacBook stuff. But um, yeah, I would definitely want to evaluate like performance features. Um, VLM also supported like ad hoc quantization really well, uh, which I don't know if you noticed, but there was that whole like argument I could just pass to pass it the, the D type, which was like just cut the, uh, the quantization in half, uh, which is very cool. So um, yeah, I think if I had more resources, if I had more time, I would have evaluated more today. Um, you know, this is the trade-off trade we had to make at the time and just kind of executed. But yeah, good question. I'd love, if you have any insights on like better <laughs> serving inferences these days, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, on your challenges slide, you've described that um, it's hard to get GPUs for you. Is, was that a matter? Can you describe that a bit more? Is it a matter of scale, scaling out or time of the day? I don't know, price? Yeah, that's a good question. The first sort of implementation of that, I was like, I was like, oh, spot GPUs are so cheap. I'm just going to use spot GPUs. I don't, I don't need to like allocate them like at myself. And that did not work. <laughs> that was bad. Uh, we maybe got a few hours a day of spot GPUs, which, you know, that's the whole 
that's the whole point, I guess. Um, so we do still have some capabilities to like scale up spot GP GPUs. I would have to go into the Plumi mm -hmm. um, node pool to be like GPU, so, you know, spot pool six or something. Um, but it was surprising me that there was still even a shortage of like T4s. At one point, Azure was like, "Oh, we're experiencing like mass shortages. Please, mm -hmm. you know, like deallocate if if possible." Um, I don't think I did because we had like ten, <laughs> which couldn't be any more than like, you know. Microsoft had themselves, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very wild to me that there's still a shortage. So, but you would be, have been looking for, for like a Kubernetes cluster with nodes with GP GPUs that would have been enough? For, uh, what do you mean? I mean, would that need to be on the public cloud or could that be somewhere else? You wouldn't care as long as it's a Kate's yeah. cluster? Is it like that? I see. Yeah, we, we had also thought about trying to find a partnership with like a company like Lambda or CoreWeave or something who has hardware like mm -hmm. in a data center and that's their like core business um, and maybe get you know credits and all this stuff candidly we used azure because they gave us a ton of credits um, to mm -hmm. partner with them and then you know that was even more cost reduction efforts so mm -hmm. like it was hard for us to stomach like going multi-cloud or like going in any direction you know again startup life um, regardless of potential partnership and stuff so um, i think i got to finish it up there uh, but Thank you, everybody, for coming here. I'll definitely hang around, and yeah, I would love to chat. Thank you, everybody.